broad topics, broad minds, broad hosts, but not just for broads. This is Broadscast with Kim Goldman and Jackie McDougal. Hey, Kim Goldman. Hello, Jackie McDougal. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to the latest installment of Broadscast. <laughs> I feel like I should be like, I don't know. Hello. Very Hello official. Hello and welcome to Broadcast. <laughs> welcome to Movie Phone. Um, so, hey, you were just saying off the air that uh, they're... Knock, knock. <laughs> what? Knock, knock. Who's there? Beats. Beats who? Beats me. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> can you explain to everybody that today is what? Today's National Knock Knock Day. Yeah, like knock, forget, knock, forget yeah. Halloween, right? Yeah. So It's Knock uh, Knock Jokes Day. It is also National Magic Day. Girl Scout Founders Day, National Caramel Apple Day. All Halloween. on October 31st? What? All of those are on October 31st? Yeah. Wow. Because Halloween wasn't enough. So. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, knock, knock. Who's there? A broken pencil. A broken pencil who? Never mind. It's pointless. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good one? <sighs> My kids do this one and it drives me crazy. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting, Interrupting cow. cow. Interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> How did you Wait, know I got one more. Coming? Knock, knock. <laughs> Who's there? Yoda lady. Yoda lady? Who? Good job, yodeling. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to be here all day? I swear we have a show today. I swear we do. Do we though? Um, yeah. Yeah. We joke a lot um, on this show about how many random uh, uh, but knock, knock, I mean, excuse me, um, <laughs> national days there are. So uh, a couple of days ago was National Cat Day. Oh. Um, it was National Hermit's Day. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Who comes yeah. up with this I, The stuff? only ones I like, I like the national, I like the chocolate days. I like the wine days. I like the, I'm happy to celebrate those. That was last week, yeah. 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 I, I, I actually try to, just in case I celebrate them more often, just in case I didn't realize it was that day. Right. I just will have like. You just cover all your bases. Exactly. I mean, I mean you it's know. just the, the sourest day. I mean, like, what the heck? Anyway. Knock, knock. Who's there? Theodore. Theodore who? Theodore wasn't open, so I knocked. <laughs> You'd think it was National Wine Day in here, too, um, but it is not. No, it is not. Happy Halloween. Yeah, so um, how are you today? I am exhausted. You are? I am exhausted, but I'm doing... I'm doing. Halloween is... Uh, Halloween's a thing. I love that, like, I love that vibe of everybody being out on the street and, like, just kind of getting candy and all the kids running around and stuff. It kind of feels like how Pokemon Go did over the summer, you know? It's like you Ghoul- ghoulish. You give people a little nod to, uh, you know, you're all doing the same thing. So today was uh, Take Your Dog to Work Day, in case, you, <laughs> in case you're hearing. Oh, yeah. I, I, my, one of my three dogs is literally um, screaming, it sounds like, right now. Yeah, what's that about? I don't know. So anyway, um, we've got a great show today, though. We are talking to uh, the ladies of 411 Voices. Uh, Louise Sattler mm-hmm. and Dara. Um, and we are uh, going to talk about some th- ways and also some ways that you can kind of make your voice heard because I think a lot of people who listen to our show, um, you know, have something to say and something to do and they wa- they don't really know how to kind of make that happen. You know what I mean? So, well, yeah, I always need a, um, a, a little refresher and reminder of how to how to do those things. So I'm excited to have. Yeah. So Louise and uh, Louise Sattler and Dara Blaker. So um, yeah, we'll do that. So, but in the meantime, Kim, what else we got to talk about? Andrew um, will tell us. Hold, please. And now, broad topics. Broad topics. There's really nothing going on in the world. There is a rumor. <laughs> or there was a rumor that Drake and Taylor Swift are heating things up. Yeah. And so there was like all these crazy. Me- is it memes or memes? memes? Memes. Memes. I don't know why I can't get that straight. Memes. Um, yeah, because was... they're all about meme. Meme. Oh, see. Meme. Meme. Yeah. Yeah. So... That was trending over the over the weekend. Um, but all, like people are um, going crazy over anyone that she dates, right? Yeah, because they're thinking it's going to be in her next song. I guess. I don't know. I mean, like, I just, <laughs> I don't care. They just, yeah. I just, I just, I, I don't care actually. But I'm talking about it. But it was on, it was on Twitter. You know, well, if it's on Twitter, it must be important. Well, of course. Hey, so speaking of Twitter, do you know that they're 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 selling off Vine? Did you know that? No, I yeah, did not. Getting rid of Vine and possibly Periscope. Really? Um, like just making them go away? Well, just like selling it, or just yeah, they're not going to be doing anything to 
help continue and promote um, those two platforms. I'm not really sure if they'll sell them to another brand or, uh, I mean, another platform or, uh, yeah, but Vine is, is going to uh, be, oh, where has got to be a joke in there somewhere. Come on, Jackie. Vine is going to be without its Smushed roots. grapes. Yeah. It's going to be without its roots. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, Six- so the World Series. Oh, <laughs> right. <on. laughs> right. The World Series we could talk about. Um, yeah. Cubs. Cubs fan. Yeah. Yeah. Not really. But I know. But how can you not? I mean, although Cleveland hasn't won for a very, very long time either. Not as long. It's been 108 years. Yeah. For the Cubs. Yeah. Here, I'm not a baseball fan. Okay. I was... I'm a Cubs person. I'm a Bears person, Bulls, Blackhawks, because I'm a Chicago girl. Okay. But I do not care about baseball. Really? I don't. It's so boring to me. No, it's awesome. Really? I love baseball. Yeah, but, so, but you, you know. Do you sit and watch a four-hour game? I, I've been known to many, many times. And you yeah. know what? There's there's something about taking a nap to the sound of baseball, too. Yes, but you're not supposed to be napping while I there's know. a baseball I'm just game. Saying that's that my point. Sometimes it, for, on a, it forces on a you to Sunday. sleep because it's so boring. It's not. But what's interesting, and I don't know their names because I don't care as much, but the two there are two players, one on the Cubs and one on uh, he was the starting pitcher in last week's game um for the Cleveland Indians, who played on the same high school team in uh, our community, the high school that my son is going to be going to. They both played for Hart High School. Uh, in 2008 and they both got drafted to na- professional teams and they're playing against each other in the world series how cool is that wow right yeah that's like a dream come true right i just what are the odds what are the odds of that i don't know what I the odds know. are I'm, i, I just, wasn't very good at stats um <laughs> well they're they're highly unlikely that that would happen so um, what is yeah. more likely uh the cubs win the world series or donald trump becomes president what is more likely? Yeah. Uh, the Cubs winning the World Series. Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe. So we're, we're in the in the midst of the World Series, but we're also like just over a week away from the election. Oh. Thank Duh. goodness. Yeah. Thank all yeah. of your belief systems. I said systems. that the, most, the only thing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss from these uh, election uh, months is the SNL skits <laughs> because as I'm watching debates and as I'm watching speeches, I'm writing the SNL skit in my head. I mean, I really you could get a new job. Yeah, well, they're kind of writing them for you. Let's be honest. I know that's insane, but I can totally. <laughs> I, I've joked that I, can, I can't watch the debates now. I mean, now that they're over, but I can't watch the debates without actually seeing, you know, the two Alec Baldwin, Alec Baldwin uh-huh, and and imagining him playing it. He plays Trump so much better so. than Trump. He's At least so he's funny, good. right? He's so good. Um, yeah, and and I, uh, uh, it 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 is going to be interesting, and it's it's such an interesting time in our country. I'm, I I, you know, to have kids be part of it, and 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 not be part of it, but like be paying attention. And, yeah. Um, you know, it it could be historical. You know, I mean, it could be. Well, on, it's going to be pretty front, historical. But I mean, on right. either front, you know. Um, yeah. But. Um, we could be like, it's kind of cool to think that in our lifetime that we will have been able to elect a, an African-American president and potentially a female president. Mm-hmm. That's kind of cool. Right. Right. Know. Yeah. Who, no, it's amazing. Who to thunk it? I know. Right. So, I mean, given that, you know, they couldn't even vote <laughs> until. Who's that? Well, I mean, women couldn't vote oh. until the 20s and then African-Americans couldn't vote until, you know, many, many, many decades later. So, you know, t- the fact that we're not just in the place of the white man being right. elected, being, uh, you know, eligible is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, um, but let's, you just mentioned the kids and stuff. So there are a lot of articles out there and opinions, which I know is shocking in social media that, you know, we need to kind of shelter our kids from certain things. And, you know, just a few years ago, I was totally on board with no matter who the president was, that you, like when it was Bush, when it was Obama, like that you as a parent owe it to your small children to just show them that this place of power and this place of importance in our country, in our history, you know, you show respect. And I remember people like, you know, bashing Bush and signs and thing, and same thing with Obama. And then I felt like it was really, really sad because kids were growing up. Like I don't remember growing up at a time where – you know, people had the political beliefs, but it didn't seem to be so volatile, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to uh, the elections. But now my kids are 9, 11, and 12. You know, I, first of all, I can't fake it with Trump. It's just how I 
feel and believe and I can't for a second have my kids believe like feel like I could possibly be on board with anything he's saying. Right. Um, he, he, he is against, against everything I believe. Um, but a lot of people are saying that you should be sheltering, that you should the kids should not see the debates. They should not hear about um, sexual assault. They should not. And I am of the school of absolutely explain everything and kind of use it as an opportunity as a, a you know, as a talking point. So right. what, what are your thoughts? Um, well, there's a lot in there. So I, 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 well, <laughs> I do that. I, That's I actually, know, historically, I, I ask 15 questions and then say, what do you think? Um, so I do think that we should be respecting the position, um, as president, just like we respect high, you know, I, I was raised to respect your elders, respect law enforcement, you know, like those kinds of things. So I do believe that we should be respecting the, the office of president. I don't think that it automatically means I have to respect the person that is put into that position. Um, I think it's an opportunity, um, and it is a talking point to talk to our kids about what democracy means and what, um, social, you know, um, what some of the social impact is on, on voting one way or the other. And I mean, that's what Sam and I talk about a lot about, you know, in terms of fiscal impact and the economy and, and, you know, the, the, the social elements of, of each party and what they believe and historically what they believe. The same way that we have that discussion as it relates to religion and talking about different religions. I think that as long as I tell my son all the different sides and have healthy conversation and then encourage him to make decisions based on what his beliefs are, which usually are in line with mine, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think to shelter, you, you raise apathetic kids that way. You, mm. you I, I mean, I think there's age-appropriate conversations to be had at every step of the way i mean my son can't possibly understand because i can't um you know some of the national security stuff or you know the some of the things that come with you know talking about the economy i don't even get it so how can i explain (laughs) it to my kid but i can absolutely talk to my kid about you know sexual assault and you know equal rights and you know healthy uh reproductive like help you know women's women's Mm. choice like the things that impact me specifically i can talk to him about that and we can talk about the fact that one particular uh presidential candidate would like to take away my right to choose i can have that conversation with him Mm -hmm. um it doesn't mean that i'm being disrespectful it means that i'm actually having a lot of respect are you able to have that conversation about what you're choosing what pro-choice means yeah wow i mean my the thing is, with everything that's happening and all the topics that are coming up that are, I don't remember ever coming up in any other presidential election when it comes to, you know, assault and, and, and you know, I things like sexual that. sexual assault, but abortion, you know, and a well, woman's yeah, yeah, right to choose yeah. has always been. Absolutely. But yeah. I'm talking about personally, like, you know, Trump being accused of all these oh. things. and But I think if I'm not going to talk to my kids, they're going to hear it around the play, you know, around the schoolyard or whatever. And so my seventh grader, you know, I, I was in traffic the other day and said something <laughs> colorful and I apologized mm-hmm. and he said, Oh, that's nothing. That's like preschool compared to what I hear yeah. from my peers. And I was like, Oh, well, what do you hear? And he's like, well, I, I don't want to say the words. And then one thing, and I asked him, he said, I, I don't know how to spell it. And I said, Oh, well try. Right. And he said, R A I P. <laughs> right. So I was like, Oh, and he said, I don't know. What does that mean? Right. And I, I explained to him right. what it meant, like, you know, that, it, and it doesn't have to be a man or a woman necessarily. I said, more commonly it is, right. or even on, you know, somebody younger, right. um, but that it's against their will. And that's absolutely, you know, unwanted, mm-hmm. despicable and, you know, illegal. And, and he was like his face, I, it, it will forever be etched in my mind. Like he was so horrified. Yeah. And he's just like, that's, that's horrible. I said, it is horrible. And I said, but I need you to understand because when, if kids are making jokes like that right. or kids are talking about doing something like that, like right. you know, you are educated enough to know if it's just somebody being flip and disgusting that maybe you don't want to be friends with right. or if it's threatening. Right. And if you feel like somebody is threatened, right. you need to tell somebody, you know. Well, I think, listen, you know, politics and religion and, you know, those kinds of um volatile topics in general Mm -hmm. um i think beliefs are are passed down you know i mean it's it's i mean we had it we you know um uh i i think that 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 it you and you historically probably vote along the lines or believe you know religious opinions based on what you were raised in what your community was about right so 
you know, I, I, I think that we have an obligation to our kids to be able to have conversations that don't just are, are not just one sided, regardless of what it is. I mean, I, but that's also me. So my son knows about sexual assault. He knows about rape. He knows about a, abortion just because it has, I had to spell it. I couldn't even say it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, so when he heard those things, it's you know, well, yeah. he was able to be like, have his own opinion about what, that meant when he heard, you know, Trump, cause we, we have a thing in our house. He has to watch the news, you know, a couple of days a week in the morning. So he heard things. And I really firmly believe that it is my responsibility to now try to educate my son on those things in the world around him so that he can, you know, like your son be able to be an active um, member of the conversation in a way to thwart those things from being perpetuated in such a negative way. So the kids aren't making jokes about rape and taking, you know, video when someone's being assaulted, that they are right. upstanders as opposed to bystanders. And so I think you have to trust yourself. You have to know your kid. Um, but I, I, I don't believe in shelter, um, sheltering them completely. I think it's all age appropriate and maturity. And, mm-hmm. but I, I don't know. I just, I, I think I, here's the truth. And you just pointed out our kids are smarter than we give them credit for. They mm. know more than we think. And they um, hear and more they than hear we can more. even mm-hmm. imagine. Yeah. And so, so do we, uh, you know, do, do we leave them to cr- uh, come to their own conclusions right. or do we help them? Right. Yeah. And I think, you know what, this is, this is an, you know, again, you have to know what's best for your kid, um, based on where your kid is at. It's just like what we do in therapy. You've got to meet, meet your client where they are, you know, so you don't need to have, you know, real intricate conversations with your kid um, about what sexual assault is or rape if you can't even spell it. Like, but you need to be able to explain to him the basics. I mean, I, we talked about this a long time ago. I remember when I had to have that conversation with my son that, you know, he can't just touch someone whenever he wants to, like he had a girlfriend, like you can't just grab her hand if she doesn't want to. And I said, and equally she can't grab yours. Like you have the right to your own body right? and to be able to say no, just like you have to honor and respect somebody else that says no. And so we should be having those conversations from very early ages so that when they hear sexual assault or sexual abuse and those things, it's not a shock to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but as they get older, they should. I personally, but I'm also, you know, sometimes an anomaly in that field. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think people find, um, obviously there are a lot of topics that aren't all that easy to talk to your kids about, but I feel like if you start young yeah, um, with with just having hard conversations, it doesn't seem so... Like, I don't believe, you know, we've, we've talked about this before. Like, you don't have the talk. You have the talk 5,000 times right. at different age-appropriate levels. Right, right. So it never feels like, hey, child, I'm going to sit you down and... Yeah. So it's funny, you know, you asked me if I, if when talking about a woman's right to choose, um, I didn't just focus on the fact about the abortion element. It was just all in general about choice over my own body and what I do with it but Sam is aware of what abortion is because I think he overheard me one time Mm. like because you know in my practice we end up talking about that sometimes with about with kids um so I didn't like I wasn't parading around the house with my (laughs) abortion sandwich board um but you know And again, I always say this just because I'm pro-choice does not mean I'm pro-abortion. I'm so yeah, I saw you get argument. into a little Ugh. Twitter battle. I'm so sick of that argument, honestly. Like, Sp- people were mad at you on Twitter. Well, someone you- called me a murderer <laughs> because I was pro-choice. I'm like, that's my point. Like, how you make that leap from wanting to make decisions about my own body to calling me a murderer is just is ridiculous. It's ridiculous to me. And the fact that people would much prefer to not have their rights question as it relates to owning a gun but they have no problem taking away my the right to my own body is beyond making sense to me like people will advocate for the second amendment before they'll advocate for a woman's right to choose is like blows me away yeah i don't well, get it and i think you know I, I i as i've said before i have mixed emotions on this whole topic um but i i do believe that we can't start making certain things illegal because like what the heck is going to happen you know but at the same time that often the ones who are um, fighting the fight against those who are pro-choice are also the ones who aren't doing anything when the child is born. Right. There's like no support whatsoever, you know, or they don't believe in, in some of the things that we need in order to get these kids 
Right. Um, what, yeah, the social programs help. are against the social programs that help people that can't. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, that that's so it's like, the, you know, they force you, but, they're forcing their hand there, but then they're not going to support in but, any way. But it, it, to me, to me, and this is what I've said to my son, like it is, it is a personal choice. What, what I choose to do with my body on my time and my life and my schedule should always be my right. And the fact that it's ever up for question it, it is is a surprise to me like why, why is it only with with women like why I you know and and, and I think that's for me that like uh, let me decide and it might not be what somebody else decides to do with their life and that's the beauty in the power of choice mm. like and I and I and the fact that someone wants to take away my right to to a choice because they don't agree with it it's disgusting to me and it doesn't matter about what what we're talking about it really it it like it t- for, for me, you know, and if, and if I choose a way of life that, that, and it's the same thing with, with equal rights, it's the same thing with LGBTQ, it's all of those things. Like, why would you not want to support my right to live my life as long as it doesn't affect you? Like, it's not right. affecting you. Just knock yourself out. Like, I'm not condemning you for your choice, which is to, to be against it, but why, why are you attacking and calling me a murderer? Because my opinion differs with yours. It's it's just this is where I get like that's well that's Twitter in itself. Like people are just But that's what people think and that's why people blow up abortion clinics as they're calling the women that go in their murders, they're willing to blow up an abortion clinic and kill mm-hmm. people to prove their point. Like really? I mean, no one gets the hypocrisy in that. It's, right. It blows me away. Right. Between this election and all the there's there feel it feels like people are much more social issue oriented. Because I think for I I, I think in general, I mean, and, and maybe maybe it's just me. I I don't always understand the fiscal impact of making certain decisions on my life as it is today. Like I'm not thinking about Social Security yet because I'm only 45. So some of those decisions, it's too far off in the future for me to understand how it would impact me. Right. But equal rights, social right. issues as it relates to women's right to choose, those things impact me immediately. In some ways, if if something changes in our current political climate, um, so I think those are things that I tend to focus on. Those things mean more to me than, you know, national security because I don't know how that's going to. You know what I'm saying? Like, does that make any sense? Yeah. I think people yeah. tend to vote on the things that they actually feel a little bit more connected with. It's hard for us to understand, you know, the impact of Benghazi or Iraq because that's so. It's, we're so removed so above our head yeah. over our heads it, it, it is more so than you know equal rights for certain you know populations in our country i think that we tend to gravitate towards things that we actually can feel firsthand you right, know? right 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 nec- our neighbors like it impacts us on, on, a, on a more domestic front right i think i think you're totally <sighs> right um you know but i think that we should be probably a little bit more educated. I'm, 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 I'm saying stuff. I'm trying to be, but you were asking why people tend to focus more on the social issues, and I think that's and I think that's why because it tends to be something that we can understand because it impacts us more directly than completely. Tra- and, and on top of it, we don't we're not given all the information as it relates to national security and to you know economic impacts of things because there are certain things that's cla- that are it's classified that we we can't possibly know all of the information as it relates to nuclear weapons and. You know, in, you but know, yet people wh- don't. Be, people have no, I no problem arguing that they know everything. That's my that point. But be, but you you have to go into that argument knowing that you're not given 100 percent of the information because that would be a breach of our national security to do that. Mm-hmm. So we're all operating, you know, with with a, a lot of information. But because we're not the high ranking officials that hold that information, we don't we don't get it all. So. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I honestly, I have to say that like, it's it, it's exhausting and um, it, it hurts my head. So let's go into um, much more <laughs> interesting things. So uh, in related news, Kim, did you know that the Baldwin brothers are in a family feud over Donald Trump? <laughs> Shocking. That was alluded to in the I last think, SNL skit. I think it's hilarious because well, Alec and Billy are at odds with brother Stephen. Because Stephen is supporting Donald Trump, mm-hmm. so. Um, but really, has haven't Alec and Billy always been at odds with Stephen? I don't know which one's which. Stephen's that like that blonde one that. Um, the that, blonde one. The blonde one that's kind of like more of a stoner dude. Oh yeah, he's the one that I. There see are four of them total, right? Basketball games. Our, our kids are the same age, and so sometimes we play them. 
and my I, and then I know we have like a guest in coming. LA or yeah and so w- at, with this one particular game we we're at this really weird seedy looking school somewhere and um, he was walking around just so like he'd just woken up I mean it was probably like an, a noon game but he looked like he just woke up <laughs> and he looked a little stone right. which is really funny but uh, he was just pacing and it was just odd like wanting people to know he was there kind of a movement mm. and then all of a sudden he comes out of like where the bathrooms were and he had a pair of glasses in his hands and he's like anyone lose these these were left in the bathroom anyone lose and he was like walking around in the gym like waving a pair of glasses like anyone leave glasses in the bathroom so then like halftime comes and then we're um so second weird half. and then he comes and he had a sweatshirt and he's like waving is anyone lose their sweatshirt and i'm like is this like the baldwin lost and found show like and he had a sweatshirt and he was waving it around. Why didn't he just around. say, does like, anyone recognize me? And can you acknowledge my, my presence? Point. It yeah. was just so funny. And I was like, it was just the weirdest. But I mean, I've seen him a handful of times. So kudos to him for, uh, you know, making time to show up for his kids games. But it just was really, it was really <laughs> You sure he actually has a kid there? Or is he just maybe like the no, he does. You custodian? No, he, he's not the custodian. Um, but he, he did. No, it was just, it was, that was my, it was very funny. Yeah, lost and found, dude. So anyway, that's funny. Uh, so, so your kid—he's not in our community, though, right? This is down in like L.A. or whatever. Well, he's in—I I don't know where he lives, but we, my team, my son's team, travels around to play. But we were in—we were in uh, Southern California playing, and his kid, uh, I think, is the same age, either one like grade younger or the same age as my son's, because he plays in two teams. So, so yeah, the Baldwin brothers are. Uh, um, yeah, they're fighting over they're fighting the elections. Over. Okay, yeah. so there are four of them. Did you know that? No, Baldwin brothers. No, there. Are, um, how did we even get on this conversation? I don't um, know. There's Alec and Billy, who you were people trying to know. get me off abortion. I think. I think I was. <laughs> I was getting very uncomfortable. Um, but uh, and then there's Stephen, who's like the black sheep, and then there's um, the one I used to lovingly refer to as Fat Alec, um, da- Daniel. Oh, you remember he was on like an NBC show for a million years. Wasn't he on like I'm. With Dr. Drew, like the recovery show? No, that was Steven. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I think. Have yeah. No idea. Anyway, that's uh, crazy. So, and speaking of the Baldwin brothers, there was um, in Europe a uh, more than $5 million of cocaine that washed up on the beach found in like a torpedo-like tube. Why is that speaking of the Baldwin brothers? Because Stephen was all oh. um, Dr. Drew. <laughs> <laughs> it was oh, I a leap. you were going to like link it up to Stephen. Oh. It was a leap. He, you a know, because Dr. Drew, funny. wasn't that the celebrity rehab? Uh-huh. Yeah. So can you imagine like you're in on this beach and like, I mean, I've seen some things on the beach, but five million bucks of, yeah, so, of, of cocaine. So, and a guy found it. He was, um, he was uh, having a picnic and kite flying with his family um and then he found this uh thing washed ashore oh so crazy it's enormous and it had all that yeah anyway what would you do that's riveting <laughs> <laughs> what would i do i i i would i i have no idea i don't probably wouldn't find myself on a beach to begin with um but if a torpedo Wait, landed you, oh, because you hate be- the beach i don't love the beach right but a torpedo i don't think that i would go up to the torpedo right and, uh, right, right look right. inside of a torpedo yeah thinking there would be drugs in there i think i would think it would blow up right so all right well we're gonna move on because you know nobody's <laughs> nobody's tuning in to listen to us and and the cocaine torpedo so um <laughs> moving on so we have uh today two guests um we have one of them with us now uh louise sattler she is the creator of 411 voices louise welcome welcome can you he- uh can you hear me i can oh uh, yay yay technology Technology <laughs> is wonderful, and I know Dara's waiting as well. And yes. who's the co-creator? There's. Oh, 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 hold on, Louise. Wait, do we lose? There Louise? you are, Louise. <laughs> hey, it's Dara. Oh, Hi. sorry, we have Dara as well. Well, that's crazy. Yeah. Hold on. Oh my <laughs> goodness, Wait, we have technology is like. <laughs> Hi, Hi Louise. There. Louise, oh, yeah. we're here. Yeah, so you were talking about Dara, and we actually have her as well. I'm trying to com- combine both of you. Oh, okay, because I went mute there for a second, which I know is my brother's wishes when I was younger, but okay, <laughs> so, but. That's hilarious. So, so you were saying Dara is your co-creator? Yes, there are 
four of us. So, uh, yes, yeah, so it's Margaret McSweeney from Chicago and Beth Engelman, also from Chicago. Dara hails from Florida, and she just sent me a little text saying she's on hold. Yep, and, then yep. my, and then myself, which I used to be a New Yorker, then the Washington, D.C. area, and now, as you know, I live in Los Angeles. So yes, tell us do. a little bit about how this whole project came to be. Oh my gosh, this is like, uh, well, and it's one of those um, haphazard kind of stories where a group of people came together. uh, We were asked, all of us individually, to do podcasts like yourself for a network. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a network that you had once in association with as well. And it was... um, for a variety of reasons, we kind of disbanded a good portion of us, uh, and they were all women at the time. All of us were women with our own brands. We were all entrepreneurs, educators, something uh, to that like. And then we decided, you know, we really enjoyed that experience, that sorority feeling, right. uh, being able to help women, champion women. And so we created Dara, Margaret, Beth, and I over a phone conversation and a couple of pots of coffee, uh, 411 Voices. Wow. Uh, that's, that's what we did. And uh, then we um, kind of... Hi. Oh, and we have to... Dara on the line as well, Louise. <laughs> oh, perfect. So Dara, I'm sure, was listening in. Uh, so we got 411 Voices up and running, and it's gone through a lot of evolution and rebranding and uh we've just finished rebranding and so we're um really set to go as a kind of a group of powerhouse women and one man tommy (laughs) jurassic who are here to tell your story through our audiences and we also are uh you know media personalities in our own right so we're a little bit of several hats we can open up a millinery you know so 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 some of our listeners don't necessarily understand um and and honestly it can be kind of uh questionable (laughs) that i understand at times but tell people like what what is it that you guys do as 411 voices and and how how does it make an impact in like with brands and with uh audiences well dara um do you want me to answer that or you want to answer that one Go right ahead, please. <laughs> uh, so we have several different branches to 411 Voices. We're a huge maple tree if in that respect. So one of the things we do is we're able to create content, whether it is uh, writing your blogs or writing your posts. And then we can send out the content. We could either manage your accounts, like a social media management group, or we could use our accounts to give out your message. People who are in, for instance, the entertainment industry really enjoy that we can attend events and live tweet or live post. We can um, interview celebrities. We can go and watch television or shows from our own homes and be able to uh, share the experience and our opinions. So that's one particular part. We also tend to also go towards social good. So causes, helping philanthropic endeavors around the world even, and whether or not it is attending events again and getting the word out, or just using our channels, our own social media platforms to inform others who are in our audience on behalf of those groups. So we're a little bit different than say your standard PR Mm -hmm. because we don't compete with each other and we like to work synergetically with other groups, which is, you know, what brings us together with broadcast today. Uh, so that's in, in a nutshell. Plus, right. like I said, you know, and Darrow um, also does a lot of content creation of a different type, which I'll let her explain. Well, but, but before we get to that, I just want what I find interesting about 411 Voices, it's all of these women and one man um, <sighs> that come together, but with so many, such a diverse background and so when you're getting a message out it's coming from like everybody has such a different audience so Dara I would love to hear about you know your background and how you came to be with 411 Voices. Oh I'm one of the old timers Um, my background (laughs) is it's in the arts it's primarily music but I've branched off into music supervision script writing comedy Uh, so I really I'm a content creator and my field is entertainment, arts and entertainment, and also arts education. I've owned a music education company. Well, I guess I'll date myself if I've been doing it for 20 years. So 
I'm really from the art perspective and the entertainment perspective and the arts education perspective. So my audience is going to differ vastly from, let's say, Louise's or Margaret's because I, I, I've been serving a different audience for. Right, right. But but you don't, you, I mean, you know, the fact that you also do animations, don't you? Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I wouldn't tout myself as like the animator. I have done animations where we are in the process of creating an animated series. Um, my end of it is more character development and I've been writing the scripts. Um, but yeah, I've done some smaller animations you'll see on my website. Uh, but now with the way animation goes, um, my husband's handling that and we actually need some more animators because it's too much for just two people to do. <laughs> we have no idea yeah, what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> so Louise, but your background is very, very different from Dara's. So, so tell everybody a little bit of, of your experience. Oh, well, I'm a psychologist, which people go say, what? Uh, but, but I am a psychologist. I deal with uh, what we call rare incidents or low incidence populations in schools. So autism uh, used to be a low incidence and uh, now is more of a medium incidence. Uh, but deaf deaf, blind, blind students. And, and so that was my beginning experience. And I created my own company to help parents learn sign language called Signing Families. Through that, I marketed it through uh, social media channels, uh, got connected with different media networks. And voila, you know, the accidental entrepreneur becomes the accidental media maven, so to speak. <laughs> so I don't do very much school psychology right now. I do uh, some consulting for an educational private firm. But other than that, I spend the majority of my time building 411 voices with uh, our team who is, you know, who I, I really feel like I should introduce to all of you via this uh, forum because it is more than just four of us. And, and you're right, we do have very unique backgrounds. Each of us represent a different genre almost of, you know, professional life. So, uh, so I mean, you've I'm, got these very, very different people from all these different walks of life and they, and they kind of come together to help uh, market for other people. How do you choose who's involved with 411 Voices? Oh, that's that's a huge <laughs> question. Well, and Dara's laughing. Um, well, you know, it. we don't really add people. Uh, most of the people have been with the group now for five plus years. Uh, the only one we added was Tommy Jurassi recently and because he just was sticking to us like glue and we love him. So <laughs> He wouldn't you know, go we, away. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, okay, you know, we weren't going, yeah. yeah, we weren't going to add, you know, a, a gentleman, but we were like, you know what, Tommy, you are so part of us, you're, you're in. And <laughs> so, but it, it, we all came together and we fit together like a perfectly formed puzzle in that we represent everything from the philanthropic, like Mama Carmo from Tiger Lily Foundation, to culinary and travel with Margaret McSweeney, to lifestyle and entertainment, and even Canada, all things Canada with Jennifer Ettinger. Uh, and you know Sandy Abrams, who is right. local to LA as yes, well. Sandy has been on our show before a long exactly. time ago. Yeah. Exactly. So all you know, all of us come together and we are a cohesive group without drama, which is what I really love. Well, you know? I was going to ask that, like, how do you, how do you all manage? I mean, we, we talk a lot on our show about how women um, either are staunch supporters of each other or horrible bringer downers. <laughs> um, so when that's the you, technical yeah, term, yeah. how do you, how do you all find your groove and your niche and, and find ways to encourage each other to be successful in your own lanes and not feel like you're competing? Well, I am opening up my DSM right now looking for downers, you know, yeah. uh, what was that word you used, that term? Okay. Um, I, I think that we just don't, you know, it, it's like when you come on board, you are signing up for helping each other. And that is the common thread in our tapestry is that we're here to create an environment of social good and championing each other. And if you're full of drama, then eventually, you you know, the tree shakes and you fall off. <laughs> That's, you know, we, we've yet to say to someone, you know, you're fired. But people sort of naturally part ways because of their own endeavors don't fit or um, it's, you know, just time. They can't create enough time out of their week to dedicate to our group. So, um, you know, it, it it's. It, it is what it is. Dara, you want to add? I'm, you know, fumbling here. I'm going to crack the joke of it's because we don't live together, but that's not even 
because when we go to LA, we all stay at your house and we live together for a week and we still all get along. So. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, yeah. So, but, yeah, but we, so how do you know, uh, you know, when you get these people together, like how there must be some of the things that you do for companies and brands that some people are better at than others. Like we all have our own strengths and weaknesses. Right. So do you kind of like, like Kim was just stay in your lane or is there overlap or do you find that there's some like personality differences that you have to kind of manage some people more than others? Um, well, because we're all independent consultants for the most part, we let the companies kind of interview us and decide who they want to work with. But we assign whoever brings the brand to 41 Voices is usually the project manager, so to speak. We know each other so well, we can recommend one person or three people to help with a campaign. And then the company will have a conversation with us and to make sure we're a good fit. And so that, it, it believe it or not, it sort of works seamlessly like that without many hiccups in that having just a natural progression of company A has a relationship with one of our members who then says, you want to, you know, this brand really wants to grow in the, for instance, culinary field. May I introduce you to Margaret McSweeney? And then we all support together the work. It's not like just you one or you two. We sort of have a um, kind of an unwritten rule that we will support and help each other's campaigns. And if we're supporting it with, you know, gusto, then of course it is, um, you know, you get paid for that. But sometimes we just, you know, we throw out a tweet to help somebody else. And it is, it, it seems to work just well uh, without any problems and without, like I said, without the drama. Right. So Dara, can you give us some examples of campaigns that you've worked on and, and what your role has been? Uh, let's see, the most recent one, we did uh, the upfronts for CTV. and that So, was, so it, just for people who don't understand, upfronts is when they get together and they show all these presentations and they try to get the advertisers to get on board um, with their shows. Is that And CTV is in Canada? Yes, it is. So that, was, that was Jennifer's baby, but we all came to, to support it, and so we all retweeted or created tweets, created content to support the upfronts for, for, for Jennifer. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went out, let's see, we, I'm trying to think. So do you all fly to Canada and support no, or you just kind of like stay online? We, we well, stayed on. So Jennifer yeah. was there. I think who else, someone else flew to Canada. It was a while ago. Uh, actually, it was just Jennifer attended the upfronts and it was, it was like six months yeah. ago or, you know, we've done other things since then, but it's, uh, but yeah, Jennifer or one person, two people who are regional will go attend the events. And then we're usually given the opportunity to support it virtually. Right. Uh, there are times, though, that we get on an airplane and we go, for instance, uh, three people went to Grail Springs, oh. a wonderful spa in northern uh, Canada area or central Canada. I'm not very good with Canadian geography. <laughs> and uh, they went and they had their experience, put it on you know, camera, did a photo shoot. And then we supported the remainder of us virtually from the comfort of our living rooms. So you say that, that with no sarcasm in your voice. I know. I think I'd rather be at the comfort I of the know, spa. But wait, <laughs> but you know, well, you know, it, it, I, I, I shed a few little tears, but it was okay. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't, support. I wouldn't shed yeah. too many tears because I've seen you guys at the Vanity Fair party, which is a very famous party before the Oscars. Do you all go to that one? Well, we go to the uh, social media club. So it's Vanity Fair Social Club. So it's not the uh, the party that makes it into <laughs> between between the covers of their magazine. Right. Uh, but we're like the support crew, uh, and and it's fun. It really is. It's it's an invitation to a party. It is uh, something we dedicate and donate our time to. I should say so. But it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but it would see you know it would seem like it's fun and it's it's uh, lucrative maybe and so if say you have somebody who's on social media we talk to a lot of women who maybe have a background and have been very successful in their careers they want to do that pivot they want to move into um, either be at home or entrepreneurship and maybe social media influence is something that they're kind of uh, aware of but not really understood like how would you tell that person um, to how to get involved. What would you tell her? 
Well, if they wanted to get involved, one of the best ways for me anyway is to join Twitter chats. So, for instance, if you were to use the Vanity Fair Social Club, that would be something that I would, you know, advise people to participate in their Twitter chat. And so our... Um, and get, you know, have a relationship, build a relationship with those media outlets or other media outlets. Uh, also, finding out who are the players within, you know, a certain uh, media outlet. So if, for instance, we, you know, have loaned our talents to the Asian World Film Festival, we've helped out, uh, you know, attended, given them some tweets and... Um, attended their parties. We were just at the Hollywood Foreign Press with them. And you build relationships with those people and you continue in those relationships. So it's not um, an overnight jump into the Hollywood scene or even into a scene that is regional to you, like the New York scene or, you know, uh, you need to figure out who are the game changers, who are the people in that area, get to know them and actually build I really build a network of relationships. That's my personal opinion. Dara may, uh, uh, you know, uh, have something else to add to that. Well, the biggest thing that I hear is, you know, okay, I did a, I did a, a radio interview and I didn't sell any of my product. It didn't work. So to explain that to someone who's never done social media before, it's just like if you play a commercial once, people aren't going to run out and buy it. It's a matter of getting exposure and people seeing your your message and your brand and your name over and over in as many different areas as you can. And social media is a little bit more personal. It's not just a, I guess, a, a sterile commercial on TV that there's no interaction. There's there's personal interaction with social media that you won't get any other way. Do you think so, that do you think that now that social media has been so saturated with so many different platforms that it has the impact that it had when it was just Facebook or just Twitter? I think there's actually more impact because people are starting to streamline what they look at. Um, Louise and I were actually having this conversation this morning, how things are changing now with Vine and with uh, Twitter being sold. Um, Facebook used to be the biggest thing that it was, and now it's big again. It, it's keeping up with the changes, I think, is really important. But do you think that having so many different platforms, though, in some ways dilutes the opportunity to brand? I mean, because people are looking at so many different places. How can you have a strong presence in... 10 different places as opposed to yeah, having no, a really it, strong presence in two places. Well, it's that's a great question. Oh, go ahead, Louise. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that's a, that's a great question. And, and I always answer it with do your homework. So if I'm talking to a brand or if I'm um, consulting and this is a brand that is going to um, steer to a young, younger group, then I'm going to look at Snapchat. I'm not necessarily going to look at LinkedIn for them. If it is an older, more mature group, then, you know, we have to go where that audience might be looking. So not every age group, not every demographic is using every social media platform. And as of today, we have one less to, you know, to have to handle because Vine, you know, had a little rest in peace sign yesterday. So I feel that you just... If you're in social media management, it is really your due diligence of keeping up with it every day and knowing where the audience is going to go week by week for, you know, certain products and, and certain uh, interests. So, you what know, happens, it, it, what happens if you're, you're uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, what happens if you're asked to do a product or work with a brand that you don't necessarily love? Do you oh, do it anyway? No. No, <laughs> no, no. We've we turned down several several brands, several products on a regular basis. What are they? they I'm just I'm just uh, uh, um, well, uh, we won't represent anybody in the cigarette or vape industry, for example. Okay. okay. Um, we will not represent um, some brands that perhaps their hashtag is a little seedy. Or it's, I mean, we are, for the most part, user, family-friendly, PG kind of. And and we have turned down some um, personalities, some celebrity types that also run a little CD. Do you guys all um, have to mutually agree on that? Or is there like a, like a majority rules kind of thing? Um, like Louise Sattler, the consultant, I can work with anybody anytime I want to. But if I am going to use and integrate the services of 411 Voices, then yes, we do draw the line at, you know, certain industries that we will not represent. And it's just 
is something that we have written down in an agreement. But Louise Sattler, the consultant, seems to be all open for anything. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, no, <laughs> she likes the CD no, hashtags. No, no, no. Hashtag CD hashtag. No, I'm just well, kidding. Um, yeah. No, that would not be true. Uh, it, you know, it, it, you, you've caught me off guard. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry, that's what we do. <laughs> no, but that no, that's fun. That makes this really interesting. No, actually, I usually wouldn't know very much about those topics. Bring on a book industry or an education industry, and I will bore you to death on a tweet. But, you know, any, any of those seedier industries, eh, that's not my lane. Give it to someone else like, you know. What about, what, about when it, what about when it comes to That's politics, for example? I'm as seedy as they get. That <laughs> nice. Well. I love it, Dara. But what about when it comes to politics or just having a different opinion over something that you're uh, supporting? Well, we don't do politics, period. Oh, okay. I mean, no we politics, will, no religion. <laughs> no, well, no politics, no religion. Uh, Margaret McSweeney um, is from a political family, and uh, you know we respect that we have to sort of stay out of that political lane. Um, not to say that we don't support uh, wonderful uh, programs like educational formats or you know health initiatives, but we are not going to be. Um, polarized by any political talk and anything that we post that's political for instance is famous quotes from presidents about peace and love and those kinds right, of things. Right, right, right. So I've seen people on uh, who do similar things to you on uh, social media channels who get extremely political and it always makes me wonder if they just don't want to work ever again. <laughs> I mean to, honestly like because right. I, I've seen um, volatile uh, you know arguments and, and attacks and I'm just kind of surprised, like, listen, I, on my social media channels, if you if you look through my Twitter feed, could you kind of figure what side I lean? Sure. But, you know, I also work on the show with Kim and I don't necessarily I'm not trying to get clients necessarily like what I believe and what I think is part of what I do. Um, but I'm surprised and, and I, I give you guys a lot of props because I'm sure with that many people, you all have so many different beliefs and backgrounds that how could you use that brand to go one way or the other? Right. If you look on our 411 voices, we have two hashtags, one with social good, one without. Uh, if you were to look at it, you will not see any um, medical advice. You, you know, And we have a physician. We, ha we have a physician. And if it comes from her and her personal channels, um, you know, that's, uh, that's up to her. But we're not going to get into, for instance, the vaccination debate. We're not going to get into the election 2016 debate on our brand channel of 4-1 Voices. It, it just won't happen. We're all in agreement of that. Well, you're smart. So um, we only have a minute left, but, and I know we didn't necessarily plan any of these questions, but what would you <laughs> tell a woman? So you guys all come from different backgrounds. You're very successful in your own, you know, lanes or, uh, what would you tell somebody who really wants, they, they feel like they have a strong voice, they feel like they, they want to be more of a part of social media and, and creating this brand for themselves, like how would one go about doing that? Uh, Dara, do you want to hit it, that one or do you want me yeah, to hit I, it? I'll, I'll get on my soapbox. I did this yesterday at Starbucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I tell everyone this story and social media is just, it's just another avenue to talk to people, just like picking up the phone or, you know, holding a rally. Um, it's all about understanding business. Um, and I always use Andre Yu as the greatest business model ever. Uh, he's a, a Dutch violinist who started his own orchestra. And I say, people graduate Juilliard and there's no jobs out there. So you're, you're stuck with like, well, maybe I can get a job. Maybe I can't. Well, he created his own empire and he tours the world like a rock star. It's a brilliant business model. He's like, I want music to be fun. I want it to be the way I want it to be, and I'm going to build it that way and build it and they will come. So you put up your own Twitter site. Let's say, you, you know, you choose your Twitter handle and you start following people and you start engaging with people. It's not overnight. I and mean, that's the one thing people don't realize it. It's not overnight. Just like building a brand and selling a soda. It, people don't buy it right away. Usually it takes a few years for things to really develop and for people to catch on. But it's about putting your voice out there in, in your voice, not in someone else's voice. And it's not about waiting for someone to come get you. It's about modeling yourself after something that works, making it yours and just engaging with others and letting them know about it, letting them try it, letting them touch and feel it and, and put it as many places as you can. It takes people the minimum of five times of even seeing something to notice it. 
Right. So once you get noticed, then it's it's how many times you're going to engage and then who are you going to engage with and then start finding people who engage the same way you do. And, and I'll put a shameless oh. plug in. And if you're really stuck, give us a call. We're at 41voices.com. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And so is, that's the best way to reach you guys is 411voices.com. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a contact form in the back or we have an email address, of course, that's located there. And we basically our storytellers and we know that your story is important we want to tell it to you know expand or grow your business and I use the analogy just real quick about the phone book the phone book you know you could decide years ago white pages or yellow pages right and if you went to the yellow pages the bigger the ad the more likely people will come and see you so I believe that you know social media is the same way the more exposure the more um, platforms you're on, that's like having the big ad on the yellow pages. Right. Well, and it's great that you've been able to do it without screaming at people <laughs> and like, you know. Well, and without compromising your own personal integrities. I love exactly. that. So exactly. Kudos well, to you guys. Dara. And we're fans of yours, by the way. Don't, you know, just turn it around. Who and... isn't, really? <laughs> I, I love you guys. I think you're a stitch every day. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Louise. Thank you. Dara Blaker and Louise Sattler, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And this is just the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> it is. It right. is. Thanks, have ladies. A weekend and happy Halloween, everyone. Thank you, too. you too. So um, I just, you know, we've talked about this. Like, for people to be doing this this career or this going down this path for so many years. Right. And then just kind of, like, flip it. and like. Well, and I love that people can create their own, you know. I mean, they're figuring out a way to create work out of the things that they love on their own schedules without, right. like I said, having to compromise their integrity in certain places. And, yep. um, you know, I think what? the That's millennials awesome. figured it out faster than the rest of us, but well, we you were, know, we were bred differently. Yeah. I mean, we, we Gen raised, Xers yeah, are we getting there though, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I also think that because we were raised differently, we have the work ethic. Totally. So I feel like we yeah. learned the work ethic. So it's made this new path a lot more satisfying. You know? Yeah, and a little scarier too because you know where we. I mean, I know for me, my dad stayed at his you know place of employment for you know forty years. Yeah, you never my thought dad about, too. You know, yeah. I mean, you just don't you don't do they that. They punch so. the the clock and slide down the dinosaur, and it's like <laughs> yeah. So making you know? those changes is hard, even though you have that work ethic. Like yeah. there's that loyalty and that commitment, and um, you know that I, I don't know. So. Yeah, so it's awesome. So um, you know, I, I I love that we have the freedom to kind of do what we want to do, no matter when, and that's really the the lesson is right to choice. See how I did that? I got right back to that. <laughs> uh, just kidding. <laughs> All right, then we are done for today. Sweet. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great Halloween, and um, go dress as a clown and be crazy. <laughs> go Cubs! <laughs> you are listening to broadcast. For more from the Broads, head to broadscast.com.